Okay, great. Kimmy, what would be the title of the video? Um, oh, think? that's a good question. It might <laughs> say something like, simple like, like 2019 like, volunteer like, training like, Tower Grove House, those words in some. Uh, but I will yeah, send a link to an email that like you'll be able to connect with. And she said the red button. Yeah, so there's a little red dot at the top, yes. and then it's blinking over here, so we're assuming that it's... Yes, we're on. We'll just edit this part out. That's great. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Good job. Oh, thank you. Yes. So, Henry Shaw is where we begin. Uh, Mr. Shaw is the founder of the Botanical Garden. Um, Mr. Shaw was a, a figurehead of St. Louis that many people don't know very much about, um, and I will share why maybe um, in the course of this presentation. Um, the majority of the content we share at the house, on the west side especially of the house, is focused around Mr. Shaw's life, how he came to uh, St. Louis, how he came to be successful, and how he became successful enough to build a garden here uh, in this city. We also have the opportunity, as I mentioned, to share more about how the community changed around Mr. Shaw and how he supported and engaged with that community. Timelines are important on a base level, but I'm really not a huge fan of a timeline um, because dates aren't a, the most connective way to meet people where they are. Most uh, people that you will engage with don't have a a good timeline in their mind of what you mean when you say 1819. That's just a number to most people until you provide some context. So we share these dates as kind of cornerstones to guide the journey of Mr. Shaw uh, uh, through his life. Um, there is some of that in that quick reference guide and then there's one in this volunteer manual that's specific to Mr. Shaw. Mr. Shaw, many people are quite interested to know more about his childhood only because he was born in Sheffield, England um, to a family who were probably considered upper middle class. His mother was a part of a family who were very big in the ironworks industry in Sheffield, which is Sheffield's primary business. Uh, his father joined that business but was not very good at it. Uh, in, and found himself in quite a bit of trouble throughout his life. Um, he had two sisters, Sarah, who was quite ill and not often a part of his narrative throughout the course of his life, but Caroline uh, was very much a part of Mr. Shaw's life. She lived here in St. Louis. She helped support him in his businesses when he would travel. She would take care of his affairs and things of that nature. Um, and so you'll hear a bit about Caroline throughout the course of this. Um, that, uh, that they both died in 1891, is that just coincidental? They didn't get killed in a... No. No, they, they did not get killed in a... In a disaster or something? No, no unless you consider disease a disaster. So so I do, after Henry died in 1889, Caroline moved from St. Louis with her husband to go live with Sarah. Their family was living in upstate New York. Um, and so she moved with her young husband to live with Sarah. Uh, and then all three of them would pass in 1891, presumably from a, an illness that took the whole home. Many, many people will come into Tower Grove House asking you about how Mr. Shaw made his money. Many people are fascinated with success um, and how success works. Um, and Mr. Shaw has a very interesting story. Uh, as I mentioned, his father was not very good in business. And in 1818, Mr. Shaw the Elder was trying to remove himself from the debt collectors of England and thought, maybe I should sail to America and try to make some money. Well, they tried that, and they lost the shipment of goods they brought with them to sell. <laughs> uh, again, not very organized. But he sent an 18-year-old Henry Shaw to find the shipment of goods, and he would end up sailing all the way around uh, the eastern seaboard uh, and find himself in New Orleans, where he found the goods but decided that he was going to figure out how to sell them. So he sailed up the Mississippi River on one of the first steamboats, 
on that river and found a small village called St. Louis and decided that this is the place he wanted to be. Um, that's so idyllic and Americana in many ways, um, but, but many visitors are interested in that only because uh, they love a good underdog story and that Mr. Shaw opened a business in a place with a few city blocks because he thought that this was the next place that would be a big city. He lived above his store for many years and at that time he focused on his business. He was a very meticulous record keeper so he would redo his books multiple times um, and, was, and was very focused on his business and because of that he was able to make enough money to retire at age 39 which to a lot of our visitors say oh goodness I wish you know that's a good opportunity to to uh, break that oftentimes they're listening to you and they hear that and that's that's a moment for pause um, but at that time he was able to assess uh, and, and we have written documentation that he said you know this is all the money a man could need I'm gonna retire and so he did uh, and, and then he started the next chapter of his life, which is this garden. A big part of Mr. Shaw's story belongs to George I. Barnett. He is the architect of Tower Grove House. We spend a lot of time speaking about him um, because many of our visitors also like to know more about construction. It's amazing how many people ask me what the square footage is. Um, which I don't have an exact measurement for. Um, the addition has a measurement, but we don't have the original floor plans. Um, and so I would have to do some serious digging to see if that exists somewhere. Um, but Mr. Barnett here would be the person who would build all of Henry Shaw's homes, his town home that was at 7th and Locust, which is now our administrative building. He would build the museum building recently opened that many of you volunteer in and enjoy. He would build many structures in Tower Grove Park, uh, among other community greats like St. Vincent de Paul Church downtown. He's responsible for, uh, I think they call it the White Water Tower, the Water Tower of Grand. Um, he would um, become St. Louis's architect. Um, and, and Henry Shaw would be very, um, be very much a part of bringing his status as, as a great architect to the forefront. He was a Brit? He was. He was. And so I think that connection, um, there's actually, there's literature. I mean, I, I have, I don't have the book, but I read a book about their relationship and that through the course of their life, um, they had both a professional relationship, but it can be inferred that at some level they had a personal relationship and that when Mr. Shaw died, he gifted um, George Barnett uh, quite a bit of good sherry from his very expensive liquor cabinet um, and a clock um, from a very famous artist in St. Louis. Um, and so, so there is some connection. He, he used him to build buildings for the course of his entire life. Um, and so his signature is on quite a bit of Mr. Shaw's <laughs> legacy. When Mr. Shaw chose the spot that would become the Botanical Garden, we were just prairie grasses. Um, there would have been nothing here where we stand today. Um, this would have been outside of town. Um, and the oral tradition says that Henry would have rode out here on a horse, uh, often from the city while he was selling his goods, and would look at this spot and say, you know, this is where I want to live. And so he purchased this land and completely fabricated everything that we're seeing today, um, which is also hard for visitors to to imagine. Um, there aren't many pictures of that original time. Um, we have a few original photos from the 18. We have one photo from before the renovation was done, um, but most of the photos that we have of the house are when photography was more popular in the 1880s. The home is Italianate. We do talk a little bit about that because many people who are in architecture want to know more. Um, we're a pretty traditional looking Italianate home. 
when Henry Shaw built the home, the left side of, well, right facing, if you were standing outside, or the west side of the home, would have been the part that he lived in. The east side would have been a servant's quarters, uh, so completely divided from the west. It would have been dormitory style, and his staff would have lived on that opposite side of the house. So there is a visual difference between the east side of the home and the west side of the home. Otherwise, we're very traditional with the tower, the cupolas, um, the exterior porches um, were, were a fairly traditional Italianate house that would become George Barnett's signature um, and he would build many other Italianate homes for the wealthy of St. Louis. Um, a good example, if you've ever been to Oakland House in Afton, that is, uh, that's also a, a sister home. It looks very similar to us. Um, and so, so Henry helped George become St. Louis's architect. Henry Shaw did quite a bit of traveling after that retirement because that's what you do when you retire, right? You go on vacation. And so he traveled throughout Europe for the majority of the 1840s. He'd go and come back, go and come back. Um, and as he traveled, he was seeing gardens of the wealthy throughout Europe and became inspired and said, you know, I'm going to build my estate. I would like a large garden to surround that. However, he came to know um, a few of the scientists in this area, including George Engelman, who would help him understand the value of a botanical garden and the science of botany. Um, prior to that, Mr. Shaw would likely have just said, oh, this is attractive, this is what the wealthy do. Um, but, but coming in contact with the scientists, uh, the Academy of Sciences that was based here in St. Louis, and and others who, who saw Mr. Shaw's opportunity as a way to establish a scientific organization, um, they put him in contact with people like William Jackson Hooker, who was the director of the Royal Botanic Garden at Kew, and other people like Asa Gray, scientists in the United States who were doing botany and helped Henry Shaw understand what the value of building both an attractive walking garden, but also a botanical garden would be both for St. Louis and to his legacy. Um, and so imagine if you just sent off an email to the governor or the president and he decided to write you back. This would be the equivalent of that and that Mr. Shaw had never met Mr. Sir Hooker ever in his life. He sent a letter and said, hey, I know so-and-so. They say you might know something about this. And they became fast friends, writing letters back and forth, and they gave him advice about how to begin the garden that we have here in the United States. Um, which is why you see signatures of that in different areas. Our museum building is an exact replica uh, of a scientific building at Kew. And we have little markers throughout that are Kew inspired because at that time Kew Garden was the primary garden um, for botanical study in the world. The garden opened to the public in 1849, excuse me, 1859, which is directly after um, the, mu the museum building would be open that year. Um, it would be open six days a week as a walking garden and two days, two Sundays each year. This is extremely important and something I actually share with a lot of visitors because this indicates that while the wealthy could come on these six days of the week, anyone could come on these two Sundays because most people worked for the six days of the week. Your average working person would have worked Monday through Saturday, but if you're open on Sunday, that means any person can come, um, regardless of your socioeconomic status, um, and that speaks volumes to the type of the type of institution that Mr. Shaw was looking to to build. This is a picture of the original gate that is now our Spink Pavilion, um, where they have receptions and other things. Um, but this would have been where the original entrance was. It's, Need to see this is where the Shaw neighborhood is right now, um, but we have we have uh, quite a few interesting photos that show us exactly how somebody would have entered the garden um, and what that would have looked like coming from town. Mr. Shaw also would build Tower Girl Park, uh, which is directly adjacent to us and opened in 1868. Uh, this 289 acres um, was was a push to to show a distinct difference between what a botanical garden is and what a park is. Uh, so it was important for Mr. Shaw to understand, to show, to share, uh, that a botanical garden is an institution for science and a park is a place for recreation. Um, 
And so this park was gifted to uh, the city upon Mr. Shaw's death with many, many stipulations. Uh, for example, uh, Tower River Park could never be divided. That will be intact for the rest of any of our lives and beyond. Uh, Mr. Shaw's will dictated that if they ever tried to subdivide it, it would come back to the ownership of the garden. So I know they've tried many times since his death to divide that and it would legally come back to ownership of the garden. Um, so another, another sign of Mr. Shaw's forward-thinking legacy uh, to ensure that the things he created uh, stay intact. This is a cool picture. He's right here in the carriage uh, in front of the park. Did those original, did he build this eagle? I do believe so, yes. Yes, I believe, I believe this photo is probably late 1860s, 1870s. But he's in the yeah, yeah, he's right. Yeah, he's here in the carriage. Because mm -hmm. that's right there on the grand entrance. Mm -hmm. there. Yep, there he is, right in front of the entrance. So Mr. Shaw, um, Mr. Shaw, as I mentioned, thought a lot about his legacy and chose to build a mausoleum here in the garden. He also decided to be the only person buried in the garden. So, so he's the only one now in that mausoleum that's directly in front of Tower Grove House. Um, this mausoleum was the second built. The first one is the building that holds the uh, Victory sculpture that's further down near Herring House. That one was not satisfactory. Uh, the, the copper leaked onto the exterior of that first one and he didn't like the appearance so he built the second one and they put a sculpture inside that one. Um, this uh, sculpture of him here was taken from a, he took a photograph lying in repose and sent it off to a German a marble uh, sculpture artist uh, who made it and then that was shipped back to Tower Grove House and oral tradition says that that sat in the basement of Tower Grove House until he passed check on it or look at it or just <laughs> see it so he knows what it looks like he chose it <laughs> um, and yeah again the forward thinking he thought a lot about it and so as he was in declining health he he spent quite a bit more time in tower grove house it is where he passed in august of 1889 uh, surrounded by uh, Mrs. Edom, his housekeeper, uh, the superintendent of the garden, uh, James Gurney, his pastor um, and our priest, and uh, and a few others. But there's many articles actually. If you do an online search, uh, it was very prolific in the newspaper. The story of how he took his last breaths. Uh, so if you look up newspaper articles of him, they they detail that in a more narrative way. I, that was common at the time to to share a narrative of how someone passes, because it it, they make it sound very um, dignified and reposed, and he just, you know, was breathing shallow and he went to sleep. It was, it's very, very sweet. Um, but he had plenty of plans for the garden. Um, he knew uh, that, of course, the garden needed to carry on without him. And so he uh, made plans to identify uh, what would be next. The garden, he knew, would go into a trust um, long before nonprofits existed. Uh, Mr. Shaw decided that the, a board of trustees would manage the garden. You get many questions about if we're owned by the state or if we're owned by the city. Um, we have been with a board of trustees since his passing. Um, this was um, people he hand-selected, the mayor of St. Louis, um, certain church faculty, um, faculty from Washington University, bank, bank barons at that time. And so now we gather a board of trustees um, in a more traditional way, you know, making sure there are lawyers and, and other community members present. And he also established a working, um, a working botanical professorship at Washington University. He, he is the establisher of the botany program at Washington University. But, but chose an Engelman professor, that's what they called it, and, and that person was Dr. William Trilly. So he worked as professor at Washington University um, for a few years before Mr. Shaw's death. So Mr. Shaw knew Dr. Trilly, had met him, um, and, and presumably decided, okay, that, that professor will become also the director of the garden, which is still the tradition today. 
um, our director of the garden is still um, in more of a, um, what is the word, um, I don't want to say adjunct, but like a, Honorary. yes, more of like an ad hoc or an honorarium type of, type of professor um, with that program. The most important things that we find ourselves sharing is more about what Mr. Shaw was like. So, so while a lot of these facts are interesting, uh, people don't necessarily connect to such an unusual story because what about that story has anything to do with my story or your story? Um, so, so finding the um, descriptors of what Mr. Shaw was like is often what is connecting people to Mr. Shaw. I find myself having a lot of luck sharing how, um, how particular he was, especially in keeping records for his business. We all know somebody who's a little OCD about keeping their records, um, or somebody who's a workaholic um, that works too much and never ended up getting married, which he did not. Um, you know, we, we know a lot of people who, you know, he's been described as controlling because he wanted every element of the garden to be perfect. Um, and, and everybody knows somebody like that. We also spent a lot of time contextualizing how Mr. Shaw was a product of his times. He both employed uh, immigrants who were coming in droves in the 1850s, but he also owned slaves, which is a hard pill for a lot of our visitors to swallow. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to address that um, and some resources to, to talk about some more difficult topics. But we also are fortunate enough to share how generous Mr. Shaw was as well. His legacy here at the Garden um, is what not only gives us um, what you see here, but also the ability um, to have other institutions within St. Louis. Um, he was a, one of the founding members of the Missouri Historical Society. He gave to a variety of um, churches and and medical buildings that we still use today. I mean, that there's there's quite a bit of that that's also um, fairly fairly easy to talk about. He's also a very private person, which is why many people don't know the name Shaw. They know that it's a street. They know generally Henry Shaw's the founder of the Garden, but why isn't he as famous as like say Augustus Bush or other people of his time who he was very much engaged with, who he went to dinner parties with, who he was friends with? the Laclides and the Chateaus of his time um, are all much more famous because of their prolific personal life that was public. Uh, Mr. Shaw was very good at keeping his personal life to himself um, and hiring people who would do the same. Even after his death, they tried to employ many of his, or ask many of his lifelong employees to do newspaper articles and things about what was really happening in Tower Grove House and nobody would spill the beans. And so because of that, I feel that many people just don't know the name because there isn't as much gossip to share. And, and as a bachelor, he didn't have a family uh, that continued that legacy or children who went on to do good or bad things. Um, so, so he is a new character for many people, um, which again is kind of fun because they're getting to know somebody for the first time through the things that you're sharing. Whew, is everybody still with me? <laughs> I'm getting to the point where I'm hearing myself in my mind and I'm like, oh God, my voice. <laughs> we also do our very best to share the people who worked for Henry Shaw. You'll hear me a lot share that it can be very challenging. Uh, a lot of historic homes are, are less... Uh, or are challenged with trying to figure out how to connect to people because generally speaking old dead white people aren't the same as you and I. This life experience is so unique to one person. How do you connect that to other people? It's important for us to acknowledge there were many many people here living many many different types of lives. You've heard me mention Rebecca Edom. Mrs. Edom was his primary housekeeper. Because he was not married, she ran the house. She was um, all the way from accounting at times to, to ensuring that the house help was doing what they were supposed to be doing. Everybody's clean, everybody's fed, everybody's together. I would call her the house manager and at times uh, the only person who had direct access to Mr. Shaw. 
You'll get a lot of visitors who want to know what kind of relationship they have, because God knows men and women can't just be friends or <laughs> colleagues. We have no record of any type of relationship. However, Mrs. Edom worked for Henry for almost 30 years. And so through the course of that, after his passing, she really struggled with his death. And there are quite a few public records about things that she said. She used to claim that he would come to her in dreams and try to participate in the garden, but they kind of pushed her aside. So, so they had a very special relationship, um, but we have no record of any type of interpersonal relationship. Haley? Yes. She was married? <laughs> she was married before, and then her husband died. She came to work here at the garden, and then she was married after. Um, she has a very sad story. Um, um, she, like, like I mentioned, she left. Henry Shaw um, put a, a house over on Shaw Place in his will for her. She had a few other things, but she'd been his housekeeper for her whole life. And she was older, so not really rehirable in regards to her profession, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and so she left. She, she remarries because that was probably really her only option to stay alive um, and unfortunately chose the wrong person who was extremely abusive to her and she would eventually take her own life. Um, uh, probably 10 to 15 years after Mr. Shaw passed. John Few is a, is a fun story too. Uh, Mr. Few worked for Mr. Shaw for many years. He was a free black man uh, who came to Mr. Shaw and proved that he could read and write, and Henry Shaw hired him to do business of the garden. Um, he was a, uh, for a long time after Mr. Shaw's death, um, there's many oral traditions of him being uh, the gatekeeper over at the gate. Um, and he's one of those people that they were always trying to get to spill the beans, and he was very loyal to Mr. Shaw. Mr. Shaw um, gave him a job long before anyone else in St. Louis will, and he worked for him to his death and then beyond at the garden. James Gurney is the first um, horticulturist um, of the garden. He would come from England. He's a very interesting man. And we have images of the water lilies, the, the huge Victoria water lilies in the house, with people standing on them because visitors love to see that. Uh, Mr. Gurney was there when Queen Victoria saw those for the first time. And, and he's the one that brought them here to St. Louis. He would take care of the garden and would be charged for planting the thousands of trees that the garden would need to become a manicured space. Um, he would manage all of the workers and, and would be the on-the-ground man. So I would consider him responsible for the start of what is the horticulture department. Many immigrants worked for Mr. Shaw in, in the, both in the house and outside. A lot of the uh, those tree planters are Eastern European in the house, plenty of Irish, a few Germans, um, and, and as I mentioned, 1850s was the immigration move into St. Louis, so labor became a lot cheaper. Um, for example, <coughs> I learned the other day that when Tower Grove House was rebuilt in 1890, they rebuilt the entire east side of the house in less than six months, top to bottom completely demolished it, rebuilt it. Because labor was that prolific in this area. There were also plenty of local workers. I believe that's who's represented here. These would be people who would work on their farms um, or in other areas. Um, these are masons, they're, rebuilt, they're building the wall for the first time here. Um, so these would be masons that could be hired in the local area um, to do building of the house, building of walls, um, those more technical skills. And as I mentioned, Mr. Shaw also owned slaves. Uh, those people would likely have lived at his city home. They would have likely been uh, a source of income uh, in that they would be people that you could hire out to other people who needed laundry or other technical skills done like sewing or in-house things. Um, so we have no record that they were on garden grounds uh, and, and are continuing to do more research into that. We'll talk a little bit more about how to interpret that as we move through here. <coughs> but as I mentioned, now we have 
another family to share. Um, I'm very excited about this exhibit. We've worked very hard in the last year and a half to put together uh, a really great narrative about the Trillies family and their time in Tower Grove House. Um, Henry Shaw wasn't the only place to call Tower Grove House home. Um, and so the themes in the exhibit that you're welcome to read more about as we move um, later. This is, a good, this is a good coffee read one morning. Um, we have a few, a few different themes that we're sharing in this exhibit. This will be on the second floor on the east side of the house. We get the opportunity to talk more about family life in, 20th, in the 20th century. As you've heard, everything I've talked about so far is about one bachelor who was very wealthy who, who created a garden and that was his life's work. Now we'll be talking more about what family life is like. Dr. Trillis was married to a very interesting woman, uh, Julia. She had a college degree. Um, she was cited as an assistant to the garden at one point um, and, and would go on to bear six children for their family. Um, they, as I mentioned, four of their children were born in Tower Grove House, um, so she was very busy uh, taking care of children and, and running a house so with the support of a nanny and perhaps a cook or one other person. We also have the opportunity to talk about scientific exploration. Um, Dr. Trulise got to do the very cool turn of the century, get out there and explore the wild thing. Um, he was on the Harriman expedition that explored the wild of Alaska, which is still today one of the um, one of the original conservation of Alaska. You know what people go back to when they're looking at what original untouched Alaska looks like. Um, he was a part of this with guys like John John Burroughs, <coughs> excuse me, and Muir. He also explored the Azores, which is off the coast of Portugal, and did a lot of research in genetic um, genetic variation that our garden still picks up today with DNA technology, which is also very cool. Beyond his work uh, in his entirety of a lifetime, he was very focused on scientific naming of plants. Um, he named over 2,000 species in the course of his life, um, which is a very long process of, of um, technical knowledge and, and that means both the study and description of them um, so, so he contributed quite a bit to science. We also have the opportunity to talk about Tower Grove House being rebuilt which is um, something that a lot of people have questions about because physically it's very clear that the west side is very different than the east side um, and how the house was completely torn down and rebuilt and which include the newest technologies of the day like running water and an indoor bathroom. A lot of people like to know about that bathroom. <laughs> As I mentioned, the Board of Trustees elected to tear this down. So this is a photo of the house completely demolished. This is the house right here. This is our wonderful museum building. So they tore that building all the way down to the basement level and rebuilt it in the matter of just a few months to accommodate a family. Um, they certainly needed more space. As I mentioned, they had children. Henry Shaw had two bedrooms upstairs. That's all a bachelor would need. Um, and so a family would need many more rooms. They also had some sanitary challenges, <coughs> which they had known about for some time. Mr. Shaw had originally taken his meals in the basement of Tower Grove House. It's the coolest place in a summer home. Um, but eventually the outhouse would start to interfere with the foundation of the home. And that's when that cute little breakfast nook that's in the very back of the east wing was built off of the porch. Um, so the Board of Trustees already knew that the water and sanitation issue outside was a problem. So they fixed that up and installed um, a bathroom indoors, which would have been kind of a big deal at the time. That was not very common. Most people did not get an interior bathroom commonly until after the First World War. It also made the house a bit more square. We look like a much more traditional Italianate home now um, because there isn't that difference for house help and, and Mr. Shaw. They made the house a little bit more even and expanded it. I'm, I'm sorry, yes. I got yes. confused. Maybe I'm yes, sir. The breakfast room was added by Henry Shaw in the 1870s. And you said at the same time a bathroom was added? No, no. Okay. Yes, yes. So, so that, that exterior kitchen, thank you for clarifying. So that, that breakfast nook used to be a part of the porch. Right. Henry Shaw added that. That's the only addition he ever made to the home right. in 1870. 
So in 1890, when the Trulies family would move in, they would completely eliminate the entire east side and rebuild it with that bathroom okay, inside. I, I, I just no, that's wonderful. Thank, Thank you for clarifying. Your timeline doesn't say when he first moved in the house. No, because unfortunately, history has not captured the day the moving truck came, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. um, we have we have a, a record that says if Mr. Shaw died in August of 1889, the Board of Trustees gathered maybe a month or two later, and the Trulies family did move into Tower Hill House while construction was happening in 1890. So broadly, we can say that they moved in in 1890, but I'm under the impression, based on sources I'm putting together, that they would have lived in the house while construction on the east side, because they could still live in the west side, presumably, was going on. So it would have been Dr. Trulies, his wife, and then he had a son, Frank, and his daughter, Marjorie. That is not in the volunteer manual, so this volunteer manual goes up until Mr. Shaw's time. So kind of where we just ended. And then this new release narrative that I'm sharing is going to be in this story document. When did, when did Henry move in? Oh, 1849. Yes. Yes, he would have moved in that year. He was traveling in Europe. But the house would have slowly, they would have been building, and then by 1851, officially, he would have returned, and all the <coughs> furnishings would have magically been there. And so 51 basically. Yeah, but but many people, um, thank you for clarifying. Many people are often wondering about um, the house being built, and so we always say the house was built in 1849. Uh, he probably would not have been a resident until 1851. Thank you for clarifying. Yes, Phil. But this was not really his residence. His residence is really downtown. That's what I've always told. His is more like his country home where he went out to entertain guests and get away from the city. He just was not technically his address. That's what I was always told. Uh, on paper, I'm uncertain what his uh, formal address would be, but I would say in terms of the amount of time that he spent at the house, time about here. I would, would say the volume of time that he spent at this house would be equivalent or greater, especially as he was building the garden, would be, would be more than the time he spent at the townhouse. Certainly during the winter, when you can't move around, he probably was at the townhome downtown at 7th and Locust. But if you're building the garden and being a particular person, he was probably here quite often. I think he was voting registration in his mailbox in downtown. Right, probably because they didn't deliver mail here. <laughs> I know you're fine. Probably because mail was not delivered out here specifically. So yes, that's probably true. Yes? Well, if he bought this property, who did he buy it from? Who owned it? That's a good question. The this property um, we don't we don't have a uh, that I'm aware of we don't have a transition of of purchase I don't I've never seen a purchase document so to speak in in the traditional legal format um, there were um, he, he Henry Shaw would have owned thousands of acres in the St Louis area through the course of his life there would have been working farms in this area. Um, and there would be a farm that would be fairly close, probably on the other side of, what is that, Band of Enter. Mm -hmm. um, but we, I, can, I can't answer that for certain. I don't, I don't know of a legal document that would tell me exactly who that is. Yes, Phil? Being an ex-American history teacher, um, a lot of, it's true, a lot of the land that you're, the, you know, the Indians have a very legitimate argument that because they didn't believe in land ownership. You know, land, that the land was the part of the creator God and this type of thing. And they were just using the land. And even though their tribal land would be this, they were using, a lot of this land was just literally, they had a different concept of ownership. And when the white settlers moved in, they just took over the land. That's and so that's a true. very valid argument there. Yes, and that that's true. could be how a lot of this land was, mm -hmm. That's reasonable. That's reasonable because, again, the only history of this land that we have is an oral tradition that says that this was a prairie 
with grasses and some sassafras trees. Um, and so there's no written record of... But we were a state. It became federal land. When he purchased this land, what year did we become a state? 1821. Yes, so yes. So it could have been government property. Maybe. maybe. The land would have become <clears throat> federal land, and then you would buy the, you would buy the yeah. land from the government. Yeah. So maybe. Government. So maybe that's correct. Yes. Good conversation. Yes, yes. I do have a question back to yes. the building of the home. How did they move the furniture? How, where, where, when it came from England or yeah. wherever they came yes. from? How did they, what kind of mechanism did they use to move yes. into the home? Yes, so, so as I mentioned, because Henry Shaw was on that vacation for so long, he was traveling around Europe, buying things up. I like this, I like this, send it back on the boat. Uh, it would dock in the Mississippi, and then they likely put it on a cart and wagon it up here, because at that time, that was your primary form of transportation. There was no railroad or other. Some of those pieces would probably have been very heavy. True. Yeah, that's amazing. why Missouri loves mules. Yeah. <laughs> they can haul anything. They can haul anything. Yes, <laughs> and I, I used to give tours out the house years ago, and before I, my work schedule and all that interfered, and I stopped. Uh, and I, at that time, I was told, once again, going back to some a couple of things, where he really got his money uh, was he he realized. As the early fathers did, that this is the city of St. Louis is going to become a big city. And like you said, when he got off the boat, it was 1819, there was just a few city blocks. And time he says he's got all this money, uh, St. Louis is already a city of about 30,000 people. And he's one of these people that recognized what was going to happen and got in on building projects and stuff like that. So. I mean, you know, naturally that the business merchants in 1820 or 1825, which he would have been one, would have been aware of that potential and would have mm -hmm. taken advantage of that. Right, and selling things that people would need to build homes or to furnish homes. Um, metal works were everywhere, but eventually he would come to sell anything anyone would need, essentially like a Walmart of the early time you know you see a need you see fill fill is right you see a need and you fill it if you have the ability um and that is how you make money off of towns blossoming yes did that answer your question oh, yes thank you good good on we go we have a couple more slides and then we're going to take a break okay dr william trillies is a very interesting character um he is someone i've enjoyed getting to know in the course of the last year because i didn't know much about him before we started this process um, he was born in Mount Vernon, New York, and he is the son of, <coughs> excuse me, of a metal worker, which at that time would be like stamp press or other people who build things out of metal. Um, this is a trade, um, and so at that time it was very traditional that you taught your son a trade with the expectation that they would take on the family business. Um, and so that's exactly what Dr. Trillis did. He would become... A, uh, a tradesmith, so to speak, with his father, um, but throughout the course of his life, uh, spent a lot of time out in the woods. He was an avid hunter, fisherman, um, the, the quintessential outdoorsman that many of us are familiar with or are ourselves. Um, and so as he spent time outside just being a kid and exploring, he came to be a collector uh, and that he was known to pick up leaves or rocks or interesting things and just through the course of being outside fell in love with the natural world um, and 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 while many other people um, prior to attending college would have had classes or other things he was not technically trained until he went to college um, he went to Cornell University um, and received a bachelor's degree and then on to Harvard um, he was very um, he was a very quick learner. Um, I think he, many, many records show that he kind of stood out uh, amongst his classmates. And, and by the time he had graduated, he became a professor of botany, which was very common at that time. Botany was, a, was not a, I don't want to say a paid skill. It wasn't necessarily a profession other than to be at a university because that would give you access to do research, et cetera, um, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, that's eventually where he would come to us from. Um, he would, uh, having gone to Harvard, he would have 
um, been in contact uh, or, or studied under Asa Gray, who I'd mentioned before, was a friend of Henry Shaw's um, and would have been recommended for the job here in St. Louis uh, through Asa Gray. And, you know, he said, hey, Henry Shaw, I know this really young kid up in Wisconsin who's doing cool things in botany. Interview this guy. Um, and he would eventually, as I mentioned, gain that professorship at Washington University and then become the director of the garden. Well, Mr. Uh, well, Dr. Trelise was a was a professor there in Wisconsin. He would have met a young girl named Julia who was getting her uh, bachelor's of letters degree, which in today's world is a generalist degree. It's not a degree that the United States um, really gives out anymore, and that they've kind of transitioned it to like a general arts and sciences degree. So she would have studied things like. Um, history and botany and um, hard sciences, but also Greek and Latin and the classics uh, and literature and would have become a generally well-rounded person. She would have been one of 12 people to get that degree the year she graduated, um, which was very, uh, very unique to her time. Um, and that's where she would have met Dr. Trulis as he was a professor and she was a student. Um, they would have married. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, moved here to the garden where they would have um, had many of their children. Um, both the house has the opportunity to talk about many of those things in a variety of ways. Um, we talk about women's issues, the way that the political uh, scene was changing for women at that time. Women were organizing and doing many more things like Julia, like going to college and speaking, uh, speaking up for themselves in a variety of ways. Um, we also talk about children, both what they would have been doing at that time. We have a wonderful oral history of someone who would have also lived on garden grounds. Her father was the superintendent of the garden under Dr. Trillis, uh, and so she would have played with the Trillis children. That's how we know a bit about those children. Um, but we also talk about the hardships of family life at that time. Um, Dr. Trillis would have lost uh, a nine-month-old right after they moved into Tower Grove House, and Julia also would have had a stillborn child in the time that they lived within the house. So um, it's important to share some of those experiences because they both connect to our visitors in a variety of ways, but they also represent the time that people were living in. They're, not everything was uh, roses and butterflies, as, as many think history was. We talk about a lot of the good things, but life was equally as hard it is today. We also get to talk about women doing things, which is cool. Uh, a lot of, we have a lot of um, great images from the History Museum of what women in St. Louis were doing at that time other than being mothers and, and reaching outside of the home to work. Um, so we got a lot of cool opportunities. Like I said, this is just the beginning. Uh, this is the first year we've had this exhibit. Um, and so in future years it will change to talk maybe more specifically about certain topics. Um, but this is a general introduction to who the Trillis family is and Dr. Trillis' scientific work. As I mentioned, he was a part of the Harriman Expedition in Alaska. This is a group photo. I cannot identify him in this photo, but he's in there somewhere. His work in the Azores, as well as his scientific naming, which I mentioned before. There's lots of more great information in that story document that we mentioned before. Who's sick of my voice yet? <laughs> <laughs> it's time to take a little break. Um, so we'll probably break for about five, ten minutes. Uh, yes, please pause, Andrea. Thank you. Um, and then when we come back, and Freeman Sheldon have this crazy idea that there are a few principles that make information relevant to someone. It has to be relatable. It has to be something that you hear and you say, oh, I'm like that, or I know someone like that, or I've done that before in my life, or I understand why someone would do that. I have empathy for why someone would do that. <laughs> because that brings together that revelation, that moment that you're trying to create where it clicks for some person, where they say, oh, that's not just really interesting, that's really important, or that's really powerful, or that's really emotionally connected to a part of me that makes me feel like I know that person, or I understand who they are. Interpretation 
And making connections can often come with art, um, because art also speaks to people um, in a way that other things cannot. Um, we do a lot of art education here at the garden because a lot of times natural spaces are speaking to people because of their appearance. Um, and I'm fortunate that uh, I feel like a lot of what's in the house, um, both the individual artifacts but also the scenes that we design are a work of art in themselves. And people are going to take different pieces or notice different pieces. <laughs> and as an interpreter, it's your job to pull out what they're noticing or what they're seeing and tell a story about it that's going to bring that connection together. The most important thing that I'm always focused on is figuring out how to have someone ask me a question. My goal is always <coughs> to say something or tell a story in a way that's going to make someone ask me the next question. That sounds kind of manipulative, <laughs> but sometimes it is because I want someone to not just listen to what I have to say, I want someone to process what I'm saying in relationship to what they're thinking about. So if they're asking a question, that means that they're engaged. Sometimes I'm leading someone somewhere instead of just standing in front of them yammering on about something that I know a ton about. Just because I know a ton about it doesn't mean it matters at all to that person until they start asking me questions. Once they start asking me questions, I know that I've got them. I know that they're hooked and I know that they want to know more about what I'm talking about. So that figuring out how to ask that question is very important. It's also age appropriate. We have lots of kiddos that come, but we also have a lot of adults that come. We also have a lot of people who are a lot older that come. Um, and so the way that you share information is not uniform. Most of what I have to say, a uh, third grade class isn't going to care about. So how am I going to get these third graders to ask the same questions that an adult is going to ask? And so all of this, all of this stuff is the resource stuff that you have in your back pocket to create these opportunities to get people to ask questions, to get people to connect to the information. It's not, I'm not asking you to read this and memorize it or sing it in the shower. <laughs> I'm asking you to read this and say, hey, I really like this part about women going to college because I went to college. I think other people are going to find this really interesting. How am I going to tell a story about this? It's important to remember that we have a purpose. Um, a lot of times people, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is true in that when I say that I work at the garden in history, people say, what are you talking about? Well, don't you know about trees? Yeah, what do you know about trees? Tell me about this tree. But Tower Grove House serves a very specific part of the garden's mission, um, which is to discover and share knowledge about plants and their environment. I know that says the word plants and not the word history, but we, as the start of this mission, fulfill it every day by sharing Henry Shaw's life and legacy. The mission of the garden that you're reading here is very much <clears throat> what Henry Shaw intended to do when he built this garden. Um, and so by sharing that, our visitors are able to understand a little bit more about how this space is intentional. The space what didn't just appear out of nowhere. Somebody didn't say, let's just throw some flowers out on the lawn and see what happens. This space was very intentionally created to offer both a place for people to enjoy, but also a place for people to do research that impacts the world at large. We personally, as a mission, uh, vow to share knowledge about the life of Henry Shaw, founder of the Missouri Botanical Garden, and the history of the garden. Um, if the visitors walk away with one thing, I, I hope that they think to themselves, the coffee's back. That's not what I wanted to think. Um, that, that they've come here and understand how this place came to be, even if it's in a simple way, even if they can just say, Henry Shaw built it, which is what some of our little people are saying. Or they say, you know, a lot of people have contributed to this garden, both Henry Shaw, Dr. Trillis, and all of us standing here today continue to contribute to it. <coughs> So I want to do an exercise. 
I want you to take a few minutes and think about a memorable experience that you had at an institution of learning. That could be any place, that could be a museum, that could be an art gallery, that could be another garden or a park, um, another historic home, if that's your thing. But I want you to think about what made that experience what it was. It could be good or bad, um, but what makes that stick out in your mind as one of your, as one of your memories? So just a few minutes. Just you can write down some notes if you want to write down what you think made that a memorable experience, or just have it in your mind. Just take one or two minutes. Okay. Who wants to share their experience? Oh, Phil's ready. I knew. <laughs> I knew Phil would be ready. <laughs> Tell me. Well, mine's very. Um, it's when I came to realize there was more to art than just a bunch of lines on the wall. And I was a. Uh, I grew up in Chicago, mm -hmm. and my father was an interior decorator, and he took some classes at the art institute there, and things like that. And he would drag us three kids down there all the time, and I just wrote it. <laughs> and it was just that we were sitting in the gallery where the abstract art is. The castle's paintings are there. And it's a painting of the guitar. And the tour came in, and I'm this little eight-year-old boy sitting there trying to, you know, we're looking at something, but I always sit it, I turn and walk, listen to the tour. And the guy explained the painting that first it's just, when you look at it, it's just the man sitting there playing the guitar. But, then they, but if you look again, there's all these faces of a woman around him. And they're all obscured because they're in the background. And I had, when they left, I had to get up and look, and there they were. And that changed, I mean, it kind of sounds trite, but it changed my whole pressure of all this art was in that was like, that there must be something there that I have missed. And that's when I started my journey, I guess, with the questions that you're asking. Yeah, that's great. That's great. That's a <laughs> so good I can story. Always Thank remember you. That. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody else want to share? Yes, Tom. Yeah. Um, most of mine have been in the outdoors, like a state park, and they were um, uh, Very, I guess you know, uh, you're very involved in it. You know, you're hiking, you're yeah. you're sweating, you know, and and then all of a sudden <clears throat> something happened. I, I remember we were down in North Carolina one time. We hiked up to the top of this mountain or hill, and we were exhausted. And so we're sitting there eating lunch, my wife and I. And all of a sudden, these two guys were rock climbing, and they came over the top. Or one, it, it was it was a bit of a, a surprise, you know, that there was something there that you didn't expect to see. Or one time, we're up in the Puget Sound above the clouds, and all of a sudden, the clouds opened up, and you could see the Puget Sound, and it was it was remarkable. But then there was another time in, um, and it was a much more of a setting, like the Tower Grove House, which was the 
a legislative building on Victoria Island, and um, so they had interpreters who were in costume and in character, yes. And, yes. and they made it fun. Um, I have a hard time. I mean, I like fun stuff, and so <laughs> and so when I interact with visitors down here, I'm usually pretty informal mm -hmm. and yes. interactive and try and yes. make it fun. Yes. Because I think if you don't make it fun, I mean, they're here on vacation right. probably, you know, right. they're not here to be lectured. That's true. Yes. So those are, those are the two things that yeah. stand out. Those are great, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and made a little list of things and, and I look back and thought what they have in common and they all have emotion in common. Um, it's not dates and that kind of thing. I was just thinking what Tom said, I went to um, St. Genevieve in October to visit the historical cemetery. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they had people dressed as those people who were, yes. and they were, some people were um, affluent people and some people were just regular worker bees. But they talked about how they lived and what their life was like and uh, how they died and how their family was buried over there. and. It just really made it come alive, and I, I thought about all of those things, and oftentimes they're connected to the outside for me because it becomes almost a spiritual experience. Yes. Um, I, I, that sounds like a, I'm into dead people doing weird things, but that's not. Really, I'm really, I thought, oh my gosh, that's not the kind of thing right there. But, um, but it is making it real and have an yes. emotional experience that makes it come alive. That yes. <laughs> We'll address that, that thing later. Um, <laughs> I know, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> Does anyone else want to share? Yes. Well, hearing her talk, it's funny because when I was trying to think, I was just thinking of glimpses in my life, and I thought, well, I don't know how to really talk about it in a way that makes sense to people. But it's kind of all, like you said, where all the, for me, you know, I remember going to Europe with my parents when I was in high school, and I, and I was kind of missing my boyfriend, and I really didn't care. And anyway, I was at the Louvre, and we're walking around, and there's all this wonderful art. But then I remember going downstairs where they had all these busts, you know, from like Rome and Greece, and and I and I saw one that and I almost felt like I fell in love with him, you know. <laughs> and it was just like it really grabbed me unexpectedly, you know. And then uh, other times that I've gone places. Um, where I remember being in New York and seeing a, a Salvador Dali painting that, I, you know, I was just in college, I was with my friends and we were at the, at the Metropolitan, uh, or whatever the art, the Metropolitan. Metropolitan. It wasn't the Met, it wasn't the one for the modern art, but oh, anyway. Yeah. Um, and I was, I, once again, with my friends from college, not really, you know, paying attention, just kind of fooling around on a Saturday afternoon. And all of a sudden I walked into a room and it was his, picture that what painting that is like the Christ in space and it's really big and it just I was thunderstruck and I love when something all of a sudden happens that, that grabs somebody that, that it's just interesting or an aha moment that's that's my memories thank you yeah that's good good well thank you for sharing I asked you to do this because a lot of times those moments are coming organically, like you're describing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, like you mentioned, a person is involved. There's a person who's supporting you in having that moment that's, that's helping you identify what you're missing or telling you a story about something that you're looking twice at um, that, that's helping you put the pieces together because those organic moments like you're describing, only come every once in a while. They don't come every day. Um, and so a lot of that has to do with the art of interpretation. Um, there's a few things that interpretation has to be. Um, what we do, um, as, as Phil mentioned, there was a docent there giving a tour. That person knew the information that was on the tour, and often in a museum like that, you have different pieces that you stop at. Um, in our setting, we have um, we have those talking points everywhere um, because any object that's on display in the house has a story, um, and so I find it uh, I 
find it most helpful, um, as I mentioned, to let a person lead me there. Those moments where you notice something, you might say, oh, that's pretty, or oh, that's interesting. And if you hear that, you're able, as the interpreter, to jump in and say, you know what, that's actually a very interesting thing. Let me tell you a story about it. And then you're able to cultivate what they already think is something that's interesting by being organized, by, by already having advanced preparation based on the resources that you know, based on the stories that you can tell. Sometimes it helps to even have key points, which is what you see, for example, in this booklet that go room by room. I have bulleted a few things out here that I think are interesting, but that doesn't mean that that's what you're gonna find the most interesting in that room. These are just suggestions. Um, this manual, while lofty, is an organized version of what we're doing. We have to we have to organize it in some fashion, otherwise we'd all just be standing there trying to rack our brains for something to say. Tom hit it right on the head. What we do is fun. We're talking to people, we're having conversations. People are coming to Tower Grove House because they have interest or just a genuine curiosity about what's going on. They may not want to be there for two hours, they may not want to be there for ten minutes. Sometimes they're dragging grandpa along because everybody else wants to see it and you're trying to figure out how to make it interesting for everyone that's standing there in the group. It's not mandatory that you interpret to every visitor. There are people who come inside because of the <coughs> setting. I, I don't want to say that people are uncomfortable, but the setting is so rich and at times awe-inducing that people walk in and are just like overloaded. They're like whoa, what is happening here? And they need time to walk around. They need time to look at some stuff and to get comfortable in the space. This is not a comfortable space for most people. Most people feel like when they're in a fancy house, I hear all the time to people say to their kids, don't touch anything, stay with me. And I appreciate that they're trying to be respectful, but that's a sign that, that there isn't that level of comfort because it's a place that they're not as familiar being in which is, generally speaking, one of the challenges that historic homes across the country are having. Um, old houses, especially that reflect the wealthy, aren't relatable. It's not a place <laughs> to have fun or to laugh or to talk. It's our job to create that, uh, that space, that, that room for people to ask questions, to feel comfortable, to say, this is fun, the, the person talking to me is making a joke about Henry Shaw's business being like Walmart, it's funny, it's, you know, it's, it's a good time, and I feel comfortable if I'm having a good time. I feel comfortable to learn, to listen, and to engage with the person that has knowledge. I also have to warn you that as the person, oftentimes, well, when someone walks in, a staff person can greet them and kind of send them in different directions. But when a person finds you, you kind of become their person. They recognize that you're the person with information, and they'll come back to you, even if they see other volunteers or other staff. If you're the first person that gave them information that they understood, that they thought was funny, that they felt like we had a connection, they're going to come back to you and they're going to ask more questions before their event is over. Um, and, and creating that relationship uh, is, is something that I would encourage because that is what creates successful positive experiences that people hopefully will remember. Question? Of course. I'm, I'm stuck on the word interpretation. I see history as fact. Yeah. But when we're saying interpretation, are we, are we really saying presentation? Mm. I mean, history is fact. Well, mm, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, history is fact in that there are, there are, um, are non-negotiables like this happened at this time, or this happened on this day. Um, but as I mentioned before, just like science, if a new piece of information appears, sometimes that disproves a fact that you know to be true or a timeline that you think is something. Um, interpretation is more descriptive of the style of conversation that we're having. Again, I'm not standing up there having a lecture and people are walking by. I'm not a talking head. I'm a person having a conversation that 
interpreting this information to someone in a way that they're going to understand okay. and be comfortable learning. Did that help? Yeah. Yes, Phil. I have always used the line on Henry Shaw when starting right off with his history in St. Louis that catches their attention is that he is one of the rare men, and you think about it, it's true, he's one of the rare men in history that ends up in a spot at the right time, the right place, and has <coughs> things to offer, mm -hmm. and is able to take advantage of it, and becomes wealthy very quick. Right. And that's exactly what happened in his life. And you got him. <laughs> you got to go Right, because, because what you're saying there is not, Henry Shaw moved to St. Louis in 1890. Nobody, nobody's going to hook that. When you start telling a story about someone's life and interpreting that information in a way that's, I don't want to say more casual, but more easy to connect to, understand, um, then then you're more likely to have a moment of understanding, engagement, education. And I think that engaging and building a relationship, even if it's for a brief moment mm -hmm. in time, those people will not only enjoy the tour and the yeah. event that's going on, but they're more likely to come back and bring yes. their friends with them. Exactly. exactly. Because it's a place they feel comfortable learning instead of... That's, if they wanted the information, they can go read the book. You know, we're, we're here as vessels of that knowledge in a way that is more understandable based on where they're at. Because they might come to you and have no idea about who Henry Shaw is, or they might come to you and say, I've been here 15 times, and are going to look to you to tell them a new story. Um, and so, so, thank you. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. And I, did that answer your question? Okay, good. Interpretation is also thematic um, in that you have to organize your thoughts um, and again kind of hone that storytelling. We are, we are definitely storytellers in, a, in many ways and that's something that you kind of hone over time. It becomes more clear, this, this is what works um, for this audience or I can tell that these people only have five minutes so this is what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them in a short amount of time and then send them on their way. You know, there, there's going to be a whole variety of types of engagements you're going to have. Um, but keeping on theme is helpful. Being relevant, of course, as I've talked about with your audience is important. But this is my favorite slide because this is, this is you and this is the information. You are the Velcro that makes the information stick because you're taking what's already in their mind, you're presenting a new topic, and the way that you're delivering that topic is what's bringing those two things together the greatest comparison. I love that slide. <coughs> I will also mention that most of what we do is conversation based as we've been talking about. However, because of the scene, because of what people walk into, they're going to ask you, can I have a guided tour? At no point would I ever say no to someone who wants a guided tour. If you have time, ability, information, I would share that until they stop listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, it's a conversation. You, you're going to sign up to be located in a certain part of the house, either upstairs, downstairs, in certain rooms. You'll come to learn what you prefer or the objects in the room that you like to interpret, and you might pick that. But a lot of people want a more guided experience. I'm always happy to encourage that, and someone else can fill your slot or the staff can hop in to different areas. I would never say no to someone. But if they say, is this a guided tour, I would say, actually, we have interpreters all over the house, and this is a self-guided experience. Because a lot, a lot of people really do enjoy that free movement. They like to be able to go do what they want. They don't want to feel trapped with a person that's spewing information about them because of all those other past experiences that they've had at places where someone's talking for two hours, and they can't get away, and they wander off. And so we try to make our boundaries very clear. The staff explain this is a self-guided experience. There's volunteers ready to answer your questions if you have questions. If you walk into this room over here, they can give you a brief introduction to what's going on here. Um, and then you're on your way. Um, and usually outlining those expectations help, uh, help a, a, a visitor know what's coming to feel more comfortable and ready to to say, okay, I'm gonna go in here and somebody's gonna talk for a few minutes and if I like it, cool, if not, they're not gonna trap me. I'm gonna do
do this very quickly because we're coming on time and the next part of this is more important. We do have a reception room, as I mentioned. There is a video if people sit down. Oftentimes our visitors land in the reception room. It's real hot in the summertime. It looks like they're gonna pass out. We sit them down, we get some water sometimes. Um, but this is also where people can rest. Grandma can't do stairs. She can take a rest inside. It's getting too cold outside. You can take a rest inside. But there's a video that they can watch while they sit there and maybe learn something. Thank you. you get a brief summary, as I mentioned, in, in either the parlor or in the east wing, depending on where staff, if it's very busy, staff might be sending volunteers to you each direction. As I mentioned, you choose where you can go um, based on what you sign up for in service. And then there's one person upstairs that kind of covers the whole upstairs. So they're kind of floating upstairs to answer those questions as they come along. There's lots of cool things to talk about. The front hallway has great wallpaper. The linoleum is very cool, a renewable resource. That's the original pattern from 1860. Henry Shaw had it just a few years after it was invented. Um, and in the front parlor, like I mentioned, all of these things are talking points. So if somebody looks at this table and says, that's a beautiful mosaic table, you can say, yes, it is. That is an Italian made, hand chosen by Henry Shaw. Look at the great detail of the bees. Um, it has a wonderful botanical theme and talk more about how mosaics are made. My favorite object on this floor is right over there. It's a table made entirely from compressed paper and then painted by hand with a Japanese scene. It's beautiful. Um, so as you become a part of the house, you will learn more about all of these objects. Um, our staff, uh, this started a small project that I did for a few years where I would write uh, an artifact profile about artifacts. So you get a couple pages um, that I would research about a certain thing. So, um, say the piano, which just came out this last week, maybe. Um, and, and learn more about how pianos are made. What is the cultural function of a piano? How was this piano used? Where did our piano come from? Um, and now our interpretation team are a part of that, which is really wonderful. Uh, so we're pumping them out left and right. So we have a whole anthology from the last two years of things I've researched and we're adding to it every month. Um, so, so my goal is to slowly put together different pieces that you could choose from to tell stories from. Um, there's some great artwork in the house if you're into art. We literally have it all books. People want to know a lot about the books. Uh, most of the books behind Flexi and cabinets and such belong to Mr. Shaw. Lots of cool topics. That's an artifact profile coming up. Um, these fireplaces, wrote a profile about those. Wonderful Italian marble designed in New York City. Mirrors, glass, that one's coming up. Oh, the kids plate warmer there's a plate warmer down here that's where you get the kids because that's essentially the early version of a microwave and that's like <laughs> mind blown with the kiddos there's the small dining room as i mentioned the flow blue china is usually on display there's an artifact profile about that um stained glass is another profile coming up and then upstairs, people always want to know what the ceiling height is. I'm sorry, you do have to memorize that because people will ask you every, every single time. day. Bottom floor is 12 and a half, top floor is 15 and a half. Um, but there's a Trump Deloy mural where the wall is painted over here. Um, that's very interesting. We moved a cabinet out of the way about 10 years ago and found a wall that had been painted, which means all of these walls were painted before wallpaper was installed. Very cool. Um, the guest bedroom has portraits of scientists as well as a sister Caroline, so you can talk about a sister Caroline or how scientists were involved in the garden. It also has a closet, which a lot of people want to talk about. Closets are very unique to most historic homes because you were taxed as a room, which means most people didn't have closets mm -hmm. back at that time, but Mr. Shaw sure did. His bedroom has lots of cool things other than the books. We have a medicine chest that talks more about his later life, he did pass in that room. I'd be careful about how you share that because some people are into oh. dead people and some people aren't. Oh. <laughs> um, oh. But there's people oh. are like, Linda, you might want to be right in there. You always get uh, questions about that you too, do. even during yeah. the glow. I mean, very common, very common really that people died at their house. That's, mm -hmm. that's But you have to contextualize that for people because most people don't think of that. Yes. I mean, yes. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, and the Venetian lady painting is also a very popular painting. People want to know about who that woman was. She's a Renaissance woman. It's a copy of a painting, so explaining the history of how paintings were copied. Uh, Henry Shaw just paid an artist when he saw a painting and said, copy this. Our copy is 
fair for a variety of reasons. Um, but people want to know about her. Our basement has all of those people that worked in the garden uh, with an audio display that people can walk through. Um, this is where they get the majority of that information about slavery and creates all those questions. We'll get there. Um, and as I mentioned, there's an original side and a new wing. That new wing, people can very clearly see the difference because of the door frames, the doors, just the way the, the appearance is very different from the west side of the house. Um, because of that, um, we can transition to telling the story about this <coughs> new side of the house. Um, there will be a children's bedroom that will talk about the Trillies children, what their life would have been like, school, games, the hardships of family life, like sanitation and how children died all the time. Um, but very relevant questions to the, to the world as well as to people who are still dealing with that. Um, throughout, we also have an adult bedroom. There's a sewing machine back here in the corner. If anybody's into sewing, quilting, got an artifact profile about that. Very interesting. A lot of people very much connect to that stuff because that's a skill that a lot of people still have and enjoy. So that's a very easy way for someone to say, oh, I like that old sewing machine. I have grandma's blah, blah, blah at my house. And then you can say, sewing would have been, and tell a story. <laughs> I don't have a picture for a bathroom because somehow I've never photographed the bathroom. And right now it's got wallpaper all over it because they're putting the wallpaper in right now. But the bathroom is very interesting. In the course of studying bathrooms, did you know that one third of the world does not have a running toilet? One third. What? Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But also very interesting and something that people should know. And Haley, would you agree that when the visitors come and marvel at the bathroom, that they really are interested in the tub? Yeah, oh, they, they love, love the, the bathtub. Tub. Mm -hmm. People see the bathtub they because again, it. it's, it. it's something that yes. is very <laughs> connect. I mean, we still take a bath, and at a very base level, you see, you can imagine the people that we're sharing about taking a bath. You're in there. You're bathing your five kids. Where most people back then did not bathe that often. Right. right. Things like that. Yes. Yeah. So, so sharing that, even the construction, people want to know what it's made from. It's a, it's a, it's a good talking piece, especially with technology. The toilet is gravity fed, so you can tell. Them. I'm, I'm working on that one more quickly because I think it's very relative to how sanitation works, germ theory is very interesting, so stay tuned for whatever I put together on that, yes. So kind of a geeky sanitation question. Yes. When they put in the bathroom, yes. was there a sanitary sewer in St. Louis, or where did it go? That's a good question. I've been doing a lot of research on how water was filtered. Um, they used a sand method from the Mississippi, a lot of times the water was still from the Mississippi, and they would take sand and, and put it through sand and then put it, push it through pipes that were probably lead-based, but but still running. That's a good question. I cannot identify yet if there was a, a well of some sort around the house that that sewage went into, which was most common at the time, essentially a hole, um, or if there was a way to push it back out. Um, the year that it was installed, the roads as we know them would have been starting to take shape. Um, so the roads that we know, like Shaw, Flora, those roads <coughs> around the garden were starting to take shape. And so I don't know if they were able to put that under the road before, before the road was established. But that's a great question. And hopefully we'll be a part of that now. <laughs> I think the, didn't the water tower in uh, Park, or not Park, but Grand, mm -hmm. did that also happen with that? Yes, Phil. Phil, might, Phil knows a lot of things. Phil, <laughs> Phil from the back. I can only go by my my Indiana experience. My my mother's family helped settle Huntington County, part of Huntington County, which is now part of the Fort Wayne metropolitan area. And <coughs> they had their own homestead. A lot of those before they got their even right up until the fifties and sixties until the farmers started getting modern. All the bathrooms, the water from the bathrooms in the house that was discarded were usually connected with a little ditch that ran into a main ditch mm -hmm. that ran into the rivers. Uh, an open, and, a, a more open thing. Until yes. the county came along and changed all that. Yes, but well, I don't know of any running water near us. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you for that, Phil, yes. Yeah. So hopefully we'll find out more about that here coming up. There's also a room um, down the hallway about the scientific <clears throat> research arm of that I've been talking about, those different exploratory 
um, <coughs> times for Dr. Trillies, how Dr. Trillies contributed to the garden. There's a video in there that shows the renovation process of the house. Um, everything from how we painted, wallpapered, the whole, the whole hoot nanny. Uh, so that's in that room as well. Okay, it's already 11.45. I understand if everyone needs to go at noon, but we may run over on time, so bear with me. I will go as quickly as possible. But these are questions that are very important that I want to ask. Many, many people ask um, these questions, and I want to kind of talk through the best ways to describe on this. <clears throat> Most people want to know why the townhouse is at the garden. Um, it's now the administrative building. The best place that you can see it is in the kitchen of Tower Grove House. Mm -hmm. So often if people are asking about it, I kind of lead them back there so they can, they can see it while I'm talking. Um, but, but explaining the, the process that would have gone on to get the townhouse, Henry Shaw decided that this home would move to the garden uh, after his passing. Uh, at that time, downtown still would have been fairly prolific, um, but I think there must be at some level Mr. Shaw's forward-thinking attitude, acknowledging that things change fast around here, uh, and that he wanted to ensure that his stuff was protected for the rest of forever. Um, and so this home was moved brick by brick, uh, on wagon, horse, horse and wagon, up here um, in 1890 after he passed and put back together where it stands today, uh, which is the half that faces Tower Grove House, um, um, back in that back corner. We now use it as our administrative building. People want to know if they can go in there. Um, but that's where like Dr. Weiss Jackson's office and, and many of our other departments uh, are. There was an addition built onto it here at the garden to make it more functional, and it's very clear, you can very clearly see, if you look at the window cornices and the brick, there's, there's a pretty clear divide, but they did a pretty good job making it look okay. Um, but people definitely want to know about this, and it's a great opportunity to talk about how Mr. Shaw had some forward thinking. But that This story really tends to impact how people acknowledge Mr. Shaw being forward thinking. To move an entire building <laughs> in your will is a pretty intense thing to request, but to know that everything else downtown around it would be completely destroyed mm -hmm. is, is maybe a little bit of luck, but also very much speaks to his forward thinking attitude. Do you think? Would you have to do you know think? what the cost of that would <clears throat> Ooh, I want to say that they budgeted like five thousand dollars, and it costed something like thirty thousand dollars at that time. So they overspent, but it's what Henry wanted. <laughs> yes, Tom. So, was there anything about that building that he thought was worthy? I mean, was it architecturally unique? I mean, so was there a little? Ego involved here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of this is ego. Part of being wealthy, in particular, is that when I say the word legacy, part of it is forward thinking and generous, but the other half of it is how will people remember my name, which is which is very much a Victorian, um, a, a culturally Victorian sentiment. You wanted to make sure. The people wrote your name down in a history book somewhere. Um, part of even building a botanical garden, we're the only one in, well, we're not the only one in the country. The Smithsonian had some, some semblance of a botanical garden at that time, but we're one of the first. Why would you build something so unique unless you knew that that would also be a place where your name would be written down forever? Why would you want to be buried next to your house? So that people walk by you every day and read your name. So I kind of describe him <laughs> as a bit eccentric. Would you agree with that? Uh, no, not not from the sentiment. The word brings up like Michael Jackson. Well, I mean, he like there's a lot of association with the word eccentric these days that I would. But he posed for his own mm -hmm. sarcophagus, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. <clears throat> And they kept it in the basement. Yeah. Probably with the dead at a time or two. Yeah. He it's moved his house, an entire house, a long way, which I find, I don't want to say odd, but. That's intense. Very, yes. Very unusual. Yes. 
Yes, I don't so disagree I don't mean with any of that. Eccentric that he was nuts. I just mean different. He was very oh, absolutely. Out of the ordinary. Yes, and, and that's not an unreasonable thing to say. Even even in um, even in there is nothing traditional other than some of the cultural things he participated in: slavery, Victorian lifestyle, his furnishings, fairly traditional. But in terms of culture, not married. I'm sure people at that time were like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, what do you mean you're not married? That's not no normal. There. And I'm sure there are plenty of people yeah. whispering in the yeah. corner, just like today when they're asking, is he gay? What was he doing? They want to know those types of things because they, even today, people recognize that's not normal. That's, that's, that's someone who's thinking about other things and focused on things that were not normal to culture. So so yes, I would just be careful with that word because using that word and then not explaining it makes people think that he's in there like... Mad scientist. Yes, cutting his ear off like an artist. You know, he's, 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 he's fairly normal in that he was a wealthy white man at that time and fit into many of those cultural things, but he was definitely unique. If you think he wanted to leave a legacy, you would think, well, he'd get married and have children, and, and his children would carry on that right. legacy, but there was none of that either. So, and we don't know why. So he's a little... He's off, he's definitely, I'm sure he was definitely someone that people were like, what's going on with this guy? Like, we like him, he's got money, so he can come to dinner with us, but <laughs> why do you mean you're building a garden all the way out of town? What do you mean you're going to live out of town and just put some flowers in the ground. Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? There were a lot of things he was doing that were not of the norm. Yes, Phil? I, uh, I remember down at Christ Church Cathedral. Oh, yes. He left a lot of money to that cathedral. And in fact, he's one of the ones that helped build that Gothic. It's, it's, I don't know, a 150-year-old <coughs> cathedral. Uh, but uh, when he left money there, what you're saying is true, because I've I'm on the finance committee and I've looked at those endowments and it's amazing how he, he just didn't leave his money to the church to say you can do whatever you want. All that money is designated for certain things and that's just the way what you were saying is exactly. Particular. Very particular. And we can all relate to that at some level. Was he Catholic? I don't think he had a church affiliation. He technically Episcopalian. He there is a church on top, or excuse me, a cross on top of his mausoleum. There are Bibles in the house, prayer books, and he did donate uh, significant amounts of money to well, the he, church. He did plants of the Bible too, and yes. did a study on yes. that. Yes, I, I didn't know if he so so associated with those. I'm, I'm not. Religion. I don't have a sense um, historically if he was um, religious in the everyone's religious kind of way or if he was in church every week well, pounded right. the bible you know there, there's no at that time <laughs> either you were or or you were way out of line you know that there there wasn't much room we have records where he's not involved in uh, like the committees and stuff down there but he's very much involved obviously he must have been involved with you know, because this is the time after the Civil War, mm -hmm. and money, of course, St. Louis was to go back in history. And one of the reasons why Chicago became the center of the of the Midwest was because of the Civil War mm -hmm. between St. Louis. Because prior to the Civil War, St. Louis was the major city in the Midwest, mm -hmm. but it was threatening to go southern, and the Union, the Nation, pulled all that banking out of St. Louis and it went to Chicago. And Mr. Shaw made a lot of money off of that right. because he held up the economy in, in many ways. People who were prolific like him gave money, owned property, and would essentially be rent, rental owners, loan owners, bank owners, lend money personally because the bank was not functioning was, in a functional this way. This is what I was getting with the cathedral down yes. here. That's when they started building this huge cathedral. Right. And of course, the money for that was going to come from him. Yes. Well, you know, some of the money is going to come from him. So. so yes, I mean, he, he was, uh, it was also very common, and again, the difference between being unique and being traditional, it was very traditional at that time for a wealthy person to have a religious entity that they donated to. Yes, sir? Did he, he free his slaves uh, in accordance? You're, you're like in this 
PowerPoint. You know what's coming up. You know what's coming up. I'm almost there. So a lot of people, like I mentioned, want to know if Henry Shaw was married. The women want to know. They think oh, they're like they want him to be their gay best friend. They like they're very they're very interested in what his marital status was. You can't blame people because that's that's a connection point that they're subconsciously making. Either I'm married, I'm not married. You know, that I have many men who come, oh, he wasn't married, that's why he had a ton of money. Mm -hmm. You know? So, 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 a lot of people want to know, but it's a great opportunity to characterize that private nature of his life. Um, it's also important to contextualize what a man of his status could do at that time. Um, at that time, being married would have been their traditional option. However, he could do whatever he wanted with whomever he wanted without any questions being asked. He could pay for relationships. He could date whomever he wanted to. If you could take a girl out to dinner, you could take this girl out to dinner, and, and social standards would not say anything about it. It's just like today. He was also very busy at work in that, as I mentioned, at the time when he would have been marrying, he was busy writing his ledgers three times upstairs in his business. He was focused on business, and then he was focused on building the garden. And at some level, I feel from, from how I feel I know Henry, that he just got busy. He just got busy doing his own thing. And all those other relationship things were probably happening, but they're not, they're not relevant to what he was doing in terms of that legacy or ego or himself. Um, and so I do try to characterize that, again, try not to be too graphic, um, because certain people understand things in certain ways, um, but I don't have any record. We have a couple, um, personally, he'll, he'll write in a journal, like, oh, went to dinner with so-and-so in Paris, went to dinner with so-and-so, in a very offhanded way, but never a long-term relationship, never <coughs> any record of that, because he didn't think it was anybody's business which I respect and a lot of visitors enjoy hearing about because they think to themselves, what would a world without Facebook look like? When you could keep your business private, a celebrity in today's age could never keep that type of information private. The only time he did have public discourse um, was a court case that he was involved in uh, with a woman right before the garden opened she claimed that he had lent her a piano and that was an offer of marriage and he was like time out no. not what we're doing uh, she actually won and took half of his fortune at that time um, but he got a private investigator and found out that she had done this with a few other men of means in the south and was able to come back on appeal and get his money back uh, and so people really love that story because everybody loves a good gold digger um, <laughs> but it was in like the US weeklies and in the newspapers of the time because it was the most amount of money that had been won in a court case like that in this area in the United States at that time. So that was, that was kind of a big deal. That was the only time he was known for that and then after that he was like, nobody's known anything about me. Um, so you'll get that question a lot. We talked about some ghosts. I have to talk about ghosts. <laughs> well, I don't know how I have a job where I have to talk about ghosts now. Um, people want to know if the garden is haunted. It's a part of history. Unfortunately, most people think all old things are haunted. I am not certain where that comes from. I think a lot of it is media. They see movies where you go to an old house, especially little kids, because they got those Dracula, Count Chocula, whatever. Um, <laughs> And so everybody assumes, and again, because people die in their homes, they just assume all old things are haunted. I am very sensitive to this narrative as a person, uh, regardless of what my spiritual beliefs are. Uh, we as interpreters are not there to share that narrative specifically. Um, we are there to share the history of the garden. That usually involves factual information, and I can't verify anything in relationship to that. Um, there are things that you will hear that are strange occurrences that have happened on garden grounds. There is one specific paranormal group in the St. Louis area that's very interested in the garden. Um, but on a regular basis, I discourage our volunteers from openly sharing about this because you don't know what a visitor is going 
to do in reaction to that. I've had people who come to the door and said, I do not want to go inside because I've heard that it's haunted. And that to me is a problem because that means that, that they're cutting off an educational opportunity because they're worried about spirits, which is their right and I respect that. But I'm trying to do my very best to discourage people from encouraging that narrative. We do have ghost tours in the <coughs> October months that are great history tours um, that do tell some of the unusual things. We do that in that setting, that one time of the year. If people ask me this question, I encourage them to Google it if they're really that interested. Because if you Google it, you will find something. Um, but it is not my job to share that openly with the majority of our visitors because even if the person asking me is interested there might be somebody walking behind me who's going to overhear me and be like wait what I don't like that at all I'm leaving and that's impacting visitor experience on the whole so so that's generally where I am at with ghosts yes Phil I was once one and I would ask that three quite three times since I've been here at this garden. Are you going to kill me? I have to go to the bathroom. I'm there so sorry. <laughs> keep, keep talking. I'm only here. Maybe somebody <laughs> might know this. Yes, yes, but I've been asked so that there's there somebody buried. Okay, we should have taken those before. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll let it. And they ask me that they have to go the haunting of one of the spirits that is associated with this garden. And I've never found the information about this woman or this grave that was going to be And that's why I had that question three times. Some people will say, well, you've heard the garden is haunted, and this is where they are. Well, I mean, many of these students say, what did you hear? I don't know. I didn't know. I mean, it's true or not. Is there somebody buried over there? Huh. I think so. You think that you don't find that out? I'm sorry, but I'm honest. No, I mean, I think it's not. It's my question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I feel like I'm after it here. Yeah. 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 Well, we're yeah. 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 talking about the vibration. The guy takes me and he goes, I think it's some freeway on this. It's funny. Just a couple of minutes. But supposedly, this grain goes back and forth with the garden. And I understand it. Maybe it's the ladies that try to. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. Maybe he got his money back. The woman whose body is supposed to be have a grave over here in Tower Grove Park. Oh, well, I don't know that, anything about that. That it is in her spirit that is one of these ghosts that haunts this garden. I don't know anything about that. I don't know either. I've never been able to find out if there's a grave over there in that garden. Oh, we're going to park. I don't know anything about that. That's that's very interesting. I've never heard that. Sorry, I'm so sorry. The amount of fluid I have to drink to keep talking is crazy. We got two slides left, and then we'll be done. Okay. Darn. <laughs> slavery. Here, here we are. We're on to slavery. So, so this is probably the most challenging question that we have to answer at the garden in general because it's a very sensitive topic right now nationally in our community um, and people are interested um, I have a hard time gauging this this is like interpretation like a, on a thousand if I, if I can like success if you can successfully do this you know you're you're an interpreter because it really takes understanding and having a sense of why the person is asking you the question um, to be able to respond in a way that's going to um, contextualize and make them comfortable with what they're trying to understand. Um, obviously, <coughs> Henry Sh when Henry Shaw arrived in St. Louis, the, the, the race relations of St. Louis were very interesting. There were, there were French, there were Spanish, there were Indians, there were free blacks, and there were slaves. Uh, among the European, like Englishmen, like Henry Shaw. Um, and so St. Louis grew up with these very different racial relationships. Henry Shaw being English, um, there are writings and journals that share that he 
said to um, a family member at one point, I don't really know about this slavery thing. You know, they're talking a lot about it before the Civil War. I'm not really sure how this is going to continue to play out. That's in the 1820s. And by the 1830s, Henry Shaw owns people. So he entered the slave trade. I do not have a formal record of why he made that decision. He, well, the only records we really have of those individuals are tax records because they're technically property. And so that's the only way we can keep track of who these people are. Um, that's unfortunate um, because that makes it more difficult to give life to who these people are as individuals. Um, and because of that, um, these people, like I mentioned, were, were probably laborers. Um, it was very common in St. Louis for someone to own a slave to hire them out to be a form of income. So they would send them to someone else's house that need their laundry done that day. Then you send them to someone else's house the next day so that they could continue to make an income for the owner. Um, regardless, <coughs> Henry Shaw owned 11 people and in the course of that time would have many slaves who would try to run away. So in 1853 and then again in 1855, he had to hire a bounty hunter to find slaves who were running away. This isn't surprising. St. Louis was a part of the Underground Railroad. Places like the Mary Meacham Trail that we're familiar with now as landmarks would have been moving slaves up north. Um, and so they would have had access in the city of St. Louis to, to leaving. He would have tracked these people down and then they would have been sold to the south. Um, at that time, being sold downriver would essentially be a death sentence. You would go and work until you died. So a lot of those people we only have again. Um, those tax records go until 1858 and then those people disappear. So through the course of that time, they're either sold or again, as I mentioned, if they ran away and were sold down river. Um, that means he's out of the slave business by the time the Civil War comes around. We have no idea what his personal ideology was in regards to the Civil War. He had people from both sides um, of the fence, so to speak, come to Tower Grove House or, and to his city home to have dinner. So he was entertaining people from the South and from the North. Again, that private personality keeps us from really understanding what his his political preferences were in that. Um, either way, I think it's important to characterize what was happening contextually at that time. Again, we're back to condition, traditional versus outside of the box. In this instance, as a wealthy person, a lot of land, a lot of holdings, it would not be uncommon that you would enter into the slave trade. It's just not that uncommon. Um, and I think people are more surprised when we share that narrative with them because they want to believe that these people that we hold in high esteem aren't as guilty as just an old farmer down the road who owned slaves. It's, it's the exact same situation. Um, it's not our job collectively to make any type of excuse. A lot of visitors are going to respond to you in ways that want to make it okay. They want to say, oh, but I bet he was a nice slave owner. I don't have any record of that and that really doesn't matter. That that they're gonna they're gonna try to find ways to be okay with it inside and that's okay if they are having that dialogue with you. Some people are gonna get angry. They're gonna say, I can't believe that. I didn't know that. Why don't you tell people that? Well I'm not gonna put it on the front door because it's not really relevant to our mission today. But we're certainly not hiding it in terms of it being a part of who this person was that we talk about so prolifically. Um, if there, there, are, there are many instances where people just need to process it and that's okay. If they're angry with you, if they're happy, if they're trying to make excuses, whatever they're trying to do, <laughs> that's okay. Um, it's our job to share the facts and to share the context of history, which was this is how economic labor was done at that time. Mr. Shaw was a businessman. Mr. Shaw got out of the slave business at the end of the 1850s, which coincidentally is when immigrant labor became so cheap. It's very likely that he got priced out of 
the slave business. It's cheaper to hire an Irishman to do the same type of labor instead of having to feed and clothe and take care of a whole person. And so that's that's an economic conversation. That's about that's about contextualizing the time. That's a totally separate thing from the emotional part that people are going to want to need to have. Um, again, I have other resources that I try to provide throughout the year to remind and give pointers on how to have difficult conversations. Um, I always warn our new volunteers that it is uncomfortable and it's always going to be uncomfortable. Especially because as we look around to each other, most of us sitting here are not people who could, could understand what the individual life experience of an enslaved person is. Um, so, so having that awareness is okay. Being able to say, this is not okay. This isn't an excuse. This is what history is. This is this real. Um, and letting people <clears throat> feel that is is what we're trying to give people space to do. Yes, Tom. So I was told by somebody who is on staff here at the garden, which does not make it true, that when Henry Shaw arrived in the United States. He wrote a letter back home describing his feelings about slavery, and he was appalled and thought it was. Yeah. Is that true? I wouldn't go as strongly to say the word appalled. Well, he, he certainly said, I don't know what this is about. I don't know why this is a thing. I don't really think this is, this is going to stick around. I think this is just going to cause problems, kind of. Just a comment. Yes, more more of a commentary. He said, I, I, I wouldn't say he ever overtly said, I do not support this, but but was very much like, I don't get this. What, what, I don't get this. Is there a copy of that letter available? Not that I can think of openly. I, I know where I could find it. I and I've seen it before. Be interesting to yeah. Have a display. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did Sean Engelman ever have conversations regarding slavery? You know? Shaw I being a German. That. Okay. I can't say I can't speak to that, but it's very clear that he was very torn about this institution because his family um, specifically moved to New York because they were they were of Northern sympathy. His, they say oral tradition says that his mother refused to visit St. Louis because of the slave issue um, because they were they were more religious um, than not so so it's it's a very deeply personal issue and something that reflects more broadly because many families had that same issue so, you know members of the family over here didn't really understand it or didn't like it and then other family members were participating in it and and that's that difficult juxtaposition that a lot of studies are trying to trying to work out if you haven't been to Grant's home at Whitehaven recently they recently, probably in the last two years, they changed their interpretive mm -hmm. elements and are very, very, very well, um, very well, they're doing very well at sharing the narrative of that dissension between Julia Dent's family, mm -hmm. who were friends of Henry Shaw, and Ulysses S. Grant, who was a, a um, pioneer, so to speak, of, of slave rights after the Civil War. Um, and so they're doing a very good job. We actually took our field trip. I usually take us on a little field trip in the fall for our, one of our quarterly meetings. We went there this last year because they're doing a very good job sharing that family dynamic, which was very common at the time. So if you haven't been there, take a visit. It's free. Um, I like the way you phrased this when you said by oral tradition it is given, because I've been told many times that his mother did not approve of slavery would not come to St. Louis to stay as a definite fact, and I assume that there was some written material, but there's an oral tradition that says that, correct? Yeah, so anytime I say the words oral tradition, I am saying or acknowledging that I do not have <coughs> a written document that I can cite. If you ask me today, where is that written, I couldn't just pull it out of my pocket. So there's a possibility that there is something somewhere that would lead us to believe that. However, we're back to that interpretation conversation in that, in that I don't think there's any place that I know of that says, 
I do not approve of slavery. There's letters that say, I don't want to come there. There's all these things going on in the world. And the way that people wrote at that time is very around, it's a very circular. It's very, I don't want to come because there's a lot going on there right now. There, there's never, people weren't as direct as they are today. Um, yes, they were very cautious to say overtly, this is what I am thinking. Um, so because of that, I, when I speak, am more cautious because when I say something without the words oral tradition or resources say, or I have text citation, when somebody says something like that, that means that they're going to take it as fact. And that's part of what is challenging about this position because when you say something, people think that what you're saying is fact. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge responsibility. That, that's a lot to take on because people say, oh, well, I heard, somebody at the garden told me. And so I try to be very careful about saying, I know this to be true because other people have told me this is true, which is very different from having a cited source. Or even if I'm citing, like, there's stuff in this book, which is very well researched from our archive, but this is a secondary source. This is not a primary source. This is a secondary source because someone else has read the information and they've interpreted it to write it in a book. Yeah. So as a historian, it is my responsibility to say, someone else's interpretation of this information says, versus I have a cited source, I have a letter, I have a newspaper clipping, I have an audio recording, a video, a photograph, whatever, that I'm looking at that brings me to what I'm saying. Does that make more sense? Mm -hmm.